things you don't know about pretend. My latest hobby, by the way, is this AGW stuff. Uh, just a little background, I built a, a house that was called the world's most efficient energy house, and it was on the cover of popular science. This guy down here looks really pissed off because they're taking away his electric car. I was one of those. I drove an EV1 for seven years. That car was always full in the morning. I never went to a service station, and I didn't give a damn what fuel costs. And that was the best car I've ever driven, and GM took it away from me. Excuse me. The lease ran out, and they took it away from me. I didn't ever own it, and they crushed it. That pissed me off really, really good. Uh, here's Mike Belleville and I back in the 70s. And we've got a solar heated water. And we, and we had solar heated water at Raft in the 70s. Okay, AGW. How many do not know what AGW means? Okay, what it means is that global warming that threatens us is our fault. It's caused by man. Okay? It's not a volcano. It's because you're driving an SUV. Or you're burning coal to provide power for the country. It's your fault. That's what AGW is all about. Okay? My interest on this is not to learn to become a climatologist, but my interest has been to look at the data and look at the raw data in detail and note what's done with it. And I see the, the biggest bunch of fraud you can imagine. The rest of my talk is to talk to you about this. Okay, first of all, uh, we're going to talk about the bias at front. Normally people talk about it at the end, but I think it's important, it's important to put this in perspective. The most biased guy is an academia or government climatologist. He promotes and keeps his own job by being an alarmist, and he loses that job if he questions. Who else is in that kind of position? And the, the, the evidence for that abounds. All you got to do is look at it. Let's talk about oil. They say, oh, man, anybody that questions this is being paid by the oil company. <laughs> the oil companies? Hey, the oil companies over the last decade have invested a trillion dollars. Not this oil, I'm talking about natural gas, coal, and you know, all these guys. Without taxpayer money, they've taken the money that they make as profits and they've invested a trillion dollars in order to make energy available to fuel our economy, our freedom, our success, in our comfort of life. And the profit that an oil company makes is 5.4%. By the way, big oil, Google this and look at it. Big oil, you think the Enrons and you see know, all these Chevron guys? They are absolutely minuscule compared to the real big oil. And that's the foreign guys. They're tiny. But anyway, they take the profits and they make it so that we can discover and that we can get cheap oil if Congress will let us drill it. The government taxes them at 23%. And the government takes that money, when they make a profit of 5.4%, the government takes 23%. And they use that money, what do they use it for? What does it help us? What does it help the country? Enough said. <laughs> I gotta move on here. Uh, oh, those who plan to profit from the crisis. This is the most interesting one. Uh, how many here have read the cap and trade bill? <laughs> Where's the senator? Have you read? <laughs> Somewhere between page 600 and something and 700 and something. It says that if you ever sell your house, we gotta come in and look at your appliances. And if we don't like them, you gotta buy new appliances. Well, who's going to profit from that? A company that makes appliances, right? Watch companies that make appliances. They might have an agenda. Hey, it isn't just appliances. This company makes every electrical component for the smart grid. This company makes wind generators. Hey, they're going to do pretty good, aren't they? 
under the progressives. <laughs> oh, by the way, this company owns a major news network and a cable network. Watch that network. I won't tell you what it is. It's kind of like TMS, NBC. <laughs> <laughs> Watch that network and see what they say. They aggressively do their best to get elected people who will write regulations so that they will profit with billions of dollars of profit. And if you don't think that's bias, we need to take you back to kindergarten and explain what bias is all about. Okay, uh, uh, I'm in number six. I, I got a full disclosure here. I, I'm biased too. I'm biased because I fear expansion of government control for a whole bunch of ways. And I don't bring this point, and I'm not talking about this talk to make money or to give me a better job. I don't expect to get a dime. And I expect that, gee, I might even have to spend some time on all the tax policies. <laughs> By the way, I keep this for protection. And I don't go to driving ranges because I think I might need the ammunition. <laughs> oh, meteorologists. These are cool guys. Any meteorologists in the, in the audience? Okay, you guys go to the climatologists and the global warming guys to get your data so you can tell us what the weather is going to be. Call her out. Okay, you don't. Because you can't and they can't predict cloud formation and precipitation. What a meteorologist does, now, he does a little more, but in general, he has a lot of data and he looks at weather everywhere and he can tell which way the wind's going to blow. So if you look at all the weather everywhere and you know which way the wind's going to blow, you provide data to the TV guys and they tell us what the weather's going to be. That's what, that's, that's what they, in general they do. Now. A survey, meteorologist. <laughs> There's only about 9% of these guys that think global warming is a threat because they don't believe these guys' ability to model the important things on the planet. They model greenhouse gases because they can do that. But it's a tiny issue on what changes, and the greenhouse gas is not a thermostat that controls climate. You're going to see that later if I have time. Let me get to it. Uh, okay, you know, I've always been interested in the scares. You know, what are we scared about? Population bomb. Remember, we were told, in fact, uh, uh, does anybody know that our new science czar, uh, Holdren? <laughs> you know, it's funny, yeah, he predicted in 70 uh, that by 1980, <laughs> billions of people would starve because we'd have too many people. Right? Well, he must have thought he was, he was, he, uh, just, no, uh, 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 oh, everybody's going to predict we're run out of oil. When he started to predict we run out of oil, they said, we're going to run out of oil in six years. The next decade, they predicted we're, when we're going to run out of oil, they said, well, we're going to run out of oil in 12 years. The next decade, they predicted, they said, well, this is horrible, we're going to run out of oil in 25 years. Okay? Now, you know when they predict we're going to run out of oil? Hell, you can't even, you can't even, it's, it's way out there. Once you've got the Balkan uh, discovery up in Montana, that's more than Saudi Arabia. Every point along, the reserves of oil has been going up. Right? It's because they fail to predict that humans are intelligent. And humans figure out ways to go out and get other oil. Okay? And if you've got a trillion dollar budget to do that, you can get damn good. We will never run out of oil. What we will do, we'll never run out of oil. Coal. If it gets short, it'll get expensive, and we will move to things that are more affordable. And we don't need the government to tell us we're going to run out of oil, and we don't need the government to tell us to stop running, to stop using oil because we're running out. It's silly.